Rock and roll, we're starting again. One of these days, I'm hoping we can get a video library of all the lectures and stuff. Obviously, we missed a number, but they're kind of pushing in then to use as much technology as possible. The problem is half the time and stuff doesn't work very well, but we're going to try. Okay, but it, it actually, once we get the bugs out of all this stuff, it'll actually be quite helpful for you in subsequent generations so we can, you know, look at these things anytime you want. They'll help out. Okay, well, now, what we're going to do here... We're going to first look at regulation by non-covalent body. Okay, a few key points of this. First of all, non-covalent bonds are weak interactions. They don't take much energy to break. And it takes very little energy to form. Okay. Now, because these weak, non-covalent bonds, they can be things like hydrophobic interactions. In other words, greasy, oily stuff tries to attach to other greasy, oily stuff. It could be hydrogen bonds in some cases, not all that common. Or it can be things like ionic bonds between two different charges, opposite charges. All of those things in water are fairly weak. You know, heat them up a little bit, and those things break. Now, the problem with this, of course, an advantage of this is you don't need to use much energy. That's always a good thing, right? The, prob the problem with this is that when a molecule binds to something with non-covalent bonds, it doesn't stay there very long. Because when you look, you see all these pictures, these tertiary structures, you see them in the book, you see them on the web, I drew some crude things on the board. So you look at these pictures here, and they're static structures. That's not true in real life. It's just like if somebody took a snapshot of me right here, like this, okay? That's why I look like at that particular instant in time. A minute or two or a second or two later, I'm going to look somewhat different. I'm moving around and stuff like that. And same thing with proteins and other molecules. Molecules in real life are tumbling around, wiggling around, jiggling around, covalent bonds bend and flex a little bit, all on time scales of nanoseconds and up. So a protein is not just a static thing, it's constantly in motion and wiggling and jiggling and stuff like that, right? And what that means is if you attack something as proteins wiggling around, it's going to shake it off after a while. So when you have a non-covalent binding, it's only going to stay on that protein for a certain period of time. It depends on how tight the binding is or isn't, but you know it can attach a protein and a second later it's gone or 10 seconds, or a minute, or five minutes later. But it's going to get shaken off. So, so the binding of whatever regulator we're dealing with, they're talking about non-covalent regulation, the protein's going to shake that sucker off in a fairly short period of time. Now, another regulator could bind to it then and do the same kind of thing, but it's a short-term kind of thing. So non-covalent regulation tends to be a short-term type of regulation. Time scales of milliseconds to maybe a few minutes. A nice thing about this, though, is it's a rapid process. A protein can bind in a fraction of a millisecond, and it can get kicked off in a fraction of a millisecond. So it's quick to add on, quick to undo. And that's good when you have a situation where you require a rapid response, where the protein constantly has to change over time. Like, this enzyme is active this second, and it shut off the next second. And then it's reactivated two seconds later, and shut off a second after that. So it's good for a rapid response kind of thing. 
So, when you're in a situation where you're constantly going to have to be regulating that protein on short-term time scales, non-covalent binding is the way to go. Because you can do it. It's a rapid, rapid regulation, rapid reversal. It doesn't take much energy to do it. So it's good when you're dealing with constantly changing conditions. You constantly have to regulate this protein back and forth over short time scales. So that's in general things about non-covalent regulation. Okay, now, brings us to the next question. What kind of molecules can be used as regulators? Well, the first thing, ions. Ions can regulate numerous proteins. And the ones that are most important are calcium ions and, to a lesser extent, magnesium ions. The single positive charge ions, what we call the monovalent cations, things like sodium, potassium, they're not used so much for regulation. But calcium especially, and to a lesser extent, magnesium, regulates numerous different kinds of proteins. So that's one kind of thing. And we'll give examples of each in a few minutes. Second kind of thing. Many proteins can be regulated by non-covalent binding of a whole wide range of small molecules. <clears throat> there are quite a few lipid-regulated proteins. Certain lipids regulate many proteins. Certain amino acids or modified amino acids can regulate many proteins. Nucleotides and modified nucleotides. These are some biggies. And a whole host of other kinds of small molecules. But the, the most common ones are, modif are regulated by lipids, by modified nucleotides. Example, cyclic AMP, GTP, and GDP. Those regulate certain classes of proteins. Amino acids or modified amino acids can regulate things as well. And a whole host of other small molecules. So that's the second kind of thing we can do. The third thing we can do is we can regulate one protein by binding a specific regulatory protein to it. So other proteins can regulate particular proteins. For instance, the G proteins that we described before, and we're going to look at these guys again. The G proteins, once they're active, they work by binding to and regulating a whole slew of other target proteins. Now, one thing about proteins binding other proteins is this. If you have an ion or a small molecule, those things are fairly small compared to the protein. Picture something, oh, oh, uh, Picture something this size regulating something the size of one of these desks. That's about the kind of size difference you get. So that small molecule or ion binds, and it's going to warp the tertiary structure, probably in a fairly local area. But on the other hand, when you have one protein binding to the other, often the surface area that's in contact between the two proteins is pretty big. So in a sense, if one protein regulates another, it's like one protein coming up, grabbing the other protein, giving a really big bear hug, or twisting it or bending it. So a lot of times, other proteins can do really dramatic changes on the tertiary structure of the protein they're regulating. Okay, so that's a few generalities here. But now let's take a look at a few of these things and get a couple examples here. We're first going to take a look at regulation by the use of ions. And I'm going to do another segment here.